football and is a quarter and is a quarterback. And I I can tell you that um, for he's lucky because because he's like a second generation athlete, he doesn't get really any real special treatment within our family. I mean, he's always little Patrick, not big Pat. I mean, so I think he, in his case, he, he's, 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 he's at a benefit in the sense that, you know, he's humbled a, a quite often by just people that are in our family. I mean, nobody's in awe of him to that degree, like you see out on the streets and everything. But um, I think that you need that because it's, it, I, I'm a firm believer, it, it takes time to get used to money. And um, you see a lot of people when they come into money, they, um, it, it seems like they go off and lose their mind. But if you have a good foundation and a ground floor, I think that um, it, it, it's a nice um, stepping stone to walk out into a new uh, sort of arena or new, new experience with, with, some, with some kind of foundation up under you. Um, but that's, that's my experience with it, with my family. Yeah, thanks, Doc. I'm I'm gonna go in and say, you know, ha having been in the NFL, I think ten years. Um, even when I initially started, um, what our role is and what my job is really has nothing to do with, you know, their performance on the field or, um, you know, if we're talking about some other type of celebrity. Um, and so I initially, you know, tried to start focusing on, all right, what am I here to do to help this person? Um, because I'm not, I'm not here to, you know, make them a greater athlete. They're already that. And so once, you know, that, that kind of puts my mind in a totally different environment, totally different space. Um, and then I can kind of proceed in terms of the relationship, you know, and I was talking with Dr. Tiff about this. I think, you know, guys, once they, you know, they, they kind of have their radars up because of social media, because of when they're out in the, in the restaurants and malls and stuff like that, that, you know, they get, they already get all the, you know, Hey, can you sign this? Hey, can you take a picture? Hey, you know, that's such and such. And, you know, even people take pictures without them even asking. Um, and I think, you know, they already have their radars up. And so when they come into my office, if I, if I was to do anything similar to that, that would already strain the relationship a little bit. Um, it would, it would already put me in a different category that I want to be in uh, because they're already used to that and they have a natural um, they develop a natural resistance to it uh, because they don't they don't know these people and, and and it doesn't feel comfortable all the time. And so what I try to make sure is I, I actually do the opposite um, and just say, hey, what's up, bro? Uh, I talk to them like I'm talking to, you know, a couple of my friends. So I talk to them like I'm talking to anybody um, whom I work with, any other colleague. Um, and it just kind of like it brings their guards down and helps them relax. Um, and again, it puts the relationship in the position that we really wanted to be in. Right. So mental health challenges faced by athletes and high profile clients. If you really stop and think about it, can you imagine walking out of, I don't know, a restaurant, a store, your house and seeing this kind of image, just cameras and all kinds of stuff everywhere. No matter what you do, you are constantly being watched. It necessarily leads to stress. It creates situations where you may constantly feel like you are letting somebody down. Just recently, um, at work, I talked to somebody who talked about the idea that if they don't do their job well, they are letting everybody down. So in addition to having high standards for their own performance, they also are thinking about how this impacts the way that they are seen by other people and their value. So it makes it very difficult to have a work-life balance for people who are in these types of positions. And again, not just athletes, but anybody who's in this type of position. Um, Let's see, is there anything, something I'll say in particular too, the idea of letting down yourself versus letting down your fans is, is pretty huge. And for some of the people that I've worked with, it's hard for them to pull apart what is what. So even just recently, there's somebody who really struggled with the idea of how to continue in the position that they were in. And if they were to not stay in that position, who would they be letting down? Would it be themselves, their family, their coaches, the, the fans, whoever is watching them. And it made it very difficult for this person to make a work decision. Yeah, and Doc, um, I'll go in there. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, a lot of, for a lot of these guys, you know, being a professional athlete is, is, is cute and all, and it's great, it has some great benefits. Um, but when you talk about stress, their jobs are really day-to-day. -day. Um, you know, it's, oh, it's, 
it's it's not that somebody couldn't come in here tomorrow and, and walk them upstairs and say, hey, we're going in a different direction. We're going to cut you. We're going to let you go. Um, or this person could go out on the field. There was an individual yesterday that tore his Achilles, and now he'd be out for the whole season. Um, and so, you know, just the stress of, you know, you, you try to keep the mindset of like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm a Cleveland Brown. But for these athletes, you know, it's, it's day to day, really. Um, and, you know, sometimes that can be just added stress, just not knowing um, at times, you know, what tomorrow may look like. I, I actually would like to jump in with that because I, I agree with you. It is day to day. And 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 a perfect example is that is, um, you know, during the playoffs, um, little Pat or Pat, excuse me, Patrick was, um, you know, they, they played Buffalo and they had this whole 13 second comeback, you know, and it was this amazing game. And then the next game they played and you should have seen it went from praise to hate within like a week like seven mm -hmm. days. And if you can imagine one day someone, you know, the, the world, you know, having so much stress on you that you have to, you know, perform miracles. And then the day that you don't perform a miracle, it's like, how is it possible that you didn't perform this miracle? That is a lot of stress. And that is a day to day, um, I think, burden that some of these athletes carry around. And if, if, if you if you don't have that um, etch a sketch mindset where you can scratch that <laughs> off and keep going the next day, I think you'll find yourself probably having a shorter career than you would like, because that is a lot of pressure and a lot of stress. And I think that goes with any job that you have when the that when, when you need to perform at a high level all the time. And it is highly expected of you to do to do that. Um, but I, I, I that just came to mind because I just remember just like, you know, feeling, you know, thinking to myself, like, what what does he feel like? that he was able to pull something off one day and then the next day he was not able to pull something off and probably had a better situation attached to it. So you would have expected him to do that. And um, I, you know, I, I, I will commend that some athletes are able to say, you know what, it's a game, it happened, I, I need to be better and, I, and, and I'll move on. And I think, you know, well, he's one of those guys, you know, and I think that'll help him in the future. But if you're not, a, you don't have the, a strong mindset, um, I think you can find yourself, um, you know, pretty, pretty down in the dumps when, when the expectations are constantly um, on, on another level. And so I think to add to that, then I think for us as clinicians or growing clinicians, clinicians in training, then it's also just to remember that, um, that stressful piece that, that the athletes may have when they're coming into our offices and how we have to be mindful of like protecting that um, that space that we're in with them, making sure that we're obtaining that confidentiality um, and actually separating them as a human from that person. Um, same as Mr. Ron has said, is that, you know, they have day-to-day -day lives too, right? They're humans, they're people. So they experience being a parent, um, a brother, a family member, um, all of those things. So we have to turn off that, I think, um, what do you say, fangirl, fanboy um, thought process and really kind of check ourselves when we're working with those clients so that we're able to help them decrease their stress with the interventions and techniques that we have learned um, throughout our programs. Yes. Thank you. So keeping that in mind, these things can also impact us, the people who work and support with the people who are in these high profile positions. So they might have depression, anxiety, things that can't be seen, their diagnoses that can't be seen on an x-ray or on a CAT scan or a CT scan, an MRI, but these things can be as debilitating as a physical injury. Um, sometimes people might have problems with sleep, they might have problems getting their day-to-day -day things done, irritable, sleeping issues, eating issues, changes in energy levels. What I'm wondering and what hopefully we can all talk about is while we're working with people who have all these things happen, what do we do? How does this impact us? How do we protect them and how do we protect ourselves when we're working with them? Or do we? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I'll jump in, Dr. Tiff, again, like just in terms of like, you know, protecting them, um, you know, I, I just like as much as they're professional athletes, as much as, you know, you talk about, you know, Pat Mahomes, as much as good as he is as a quarterback, you know, you, you got to take on the mindset that you're that's how good you are in your profession as a doctor, you know, as a mental health provider. Um, uh -huh. 
And if I was to go in and ask him a question about playing quarterback, he would be able to reel it off. But what that individual needs from you is your profession of being a, a mental health provider and counselor. And they're asking you a question that they really need you to answer. Um, and it, and it's gonna, it, it may help them sleep. It may help, like we got guys that, you know, in this profession, which you don't really have in other professions, like they're guys that need to be a certain weight, right? There's guys that may be overweight or underweight um, and you want to do that for your health, but we want them to do that just so they can perform a certain way. So they're going home and they, we, you know, they need to put on 20 pounds between now and, and, and you know, August. Um, and so those things, you know, when you talk about those mental challenges, as much as much as they're a profession, professional, so are you. And they need your skill sets. And that's really one way that you can protect them as a clinician is just by understanding that, you know, they need your expect, expertise. That's why they're there. Um, I always tell Dr. Tip this, you know, because she's she and she'll say it to me like I do have a doctorate um, and she kind of flexes on me a little bit. But it's a good thing um, because it reminds me, you know what, like, you know, she obviously went to school for years and years and years to get this type of um, education, understanding, just like these athletes. And so what what we need from her, uh, we need it as much as you know, as you would see somebody playing on Sunday. And then I'll ask this question to you. How do you protect yourself? Because you're also protecting them. If something happens at four o'clock in the morning, you get a phone call. So how do you protect you while you're protecting them? Yeah, you know, I mean, at that time, um, I, I take on a servant mentality. Um, and, and so, you know, if I get that four o'clock phone call, um, the way I protect myself is, you know, by giving, you know, there's times where I need to take my own space and back off. You know, after you deal with a challenge, just say I get a call at 4 a.m. Um, and, you know, I kind of get this individual to the right people or it's been a crisis and I'm up from 4 a.m. to, I don't know, you could say nine o'clock that night. You know what I mean? There's there's different, um, you know, stress relievers and just times where I got to kind of get away from myself um, to, to, you know, just kind of, you know, create that, just bring it down a little bit. Um, but you know, in order to just, you know, just kind of just, you know, take your time. I don't know if that's what you're asking, but, yeah, it is. um, I just think it's important. Like you do got to ha have that balance, um, mm -hmm. so that you can have a clear mind and respond. Um, you know, if, if you do get that 4 a.m. call. And then Tanisha, I'll ask you the same question. You have at least three people who are pretty well known, immediately related to you and you have your own clients. How do you protect yourself from all the stuff connected to that? You know, actually, I call you a lot. <laughs> no, just, it's the truth, but um, but um, but seriously, I I try to keep in mind that I have to have a sep. I almost look at a separation from church and state. Like I kid you not, I, there's the the client when I'm dealing with 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 some of my you know clients and the attitudes and things like that. But then there's also my home life, which I always you know I have my 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 morals and my my ethics that I won't allow um, to be compromised. So I help to the best of my ability. For example, like if it's my nephew, generally it has to deal with privacy a lot. You know, if you, you notice, there's not a lot of people who know Mahomes. You may know two people, may know a Jackson, may know a Brittany, but you don't know any of the Mahomes because we pretty much stay in the background and, and we're not adding to stress. But sometimes just being away from it you know, helps, helps out that way. The other thing is, is that that also helps me because the, you know, people don't know that everybody doesn't know. So, you know, that keeps me um, sort of out of the spotlight, like out of um, some unnecessary, um, you know, uh, stress. Um, I, I had, I'll give you a quick little example. I had my, I had, I bought a house. Or the, um, the person that sold me the house told everybody that I was Patrick's aunt. The week I was there, my house was broken into. They stole every piece of memorabilia that I had of my nephew. I lost everything within seven days. You know, um, they looked at the last name, they knew. So a lot of times I'll ask them, say, hey, can you kind of keep this, can you kind of keep this, you know, quiet? Can you, you know, not let everybody know these things like that? But I do have sort of a unique, unique name. So often I can't avoid certain things, um, but I do my best to shield myself and I don't go around you know, yipping and yelling and, 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 and bringing attention to, you know, the situation as well. So that, that also helps me that I'm not craving um, spotlight, you know, via my nephew and my brother and, you know, other family members and clients at that. Yes, your clients too. That's a um, great point. I got, 
Oh, go ahead, Brittany. Oh, yeah, go ahead. oh I'm sorry. No, I, as, as we're all talking on this one and things like that, I'm also thinking how clinically how we can help, you know, these athletes during this time. And I, I instantly think about our code of ethics and I think about, you know, making sure that we're competent, mm -hmm. right? We're making sure that we're competent enough to be able to work with these clients. And then I also think about monitoring our effectiveness, right? Making sure that we are um, in check with ourselves to make sure we're able to monitor that effectiveness when we're working with clients too, right? To go back to that fan boy, fan girl thing, you have to make sure you're not fanning out to the point you just want to be in the room with them and you're not really Absolutely. holding that space with them. So I would just like to speak on those ethical things. And of course, just like how um, you said, Ms. Holmes, like calling or maybe spreading that spotlight, then that also speaks to us clinically, making sure we're not being super excited and protecting that confidentiality. Like, oh my gosh, I just spoke with such and such about that because that could then also bring spotlight and mm -hmm. really, you know, traumatize them from the counseling experience altogether. Ron, you were going to say something? Yeah, I mean, Brittany pretty much just said it. Um, just you got to take on the mindset that you're just as important as they are, and uh, and and I and I don't wear Cleveland Browns gear outside of this facility, um, and that's just my mindset. Um, I don't want anybody to know I work for the Browns, you know, as much as possible. Um, I don't, you know, because it's just not that's not what it's that's not what I'm seeking. Um, uh -huh. so I think I just wanted, I think Brittany said it and Tanisha said it as well. Just that spotlight thing is, is really crucial. Mm -hmm. That's funny. I wear most of my brown gear when I'm here in Toronto. Um, but the thing that's interesting, I do because I'm, it is distant enough from Cleveland. Uh -huh. But the other thing that I do want to make sure I highlight and Brittany, I want you to speak to this a little bit too, is we're talking about athlete and high profile clients. Sometimes those high profile people are more infamous people. So I have had clients I've worked with who were focused on some news story about something tragic that happened in the local area. That person is still very recognizable. That person is the, you know, the one when they go to Walmart or Target, people are saying things about them because they were accused of this thing, accused of that thing. That's still a high profile client. Um, people who might be involved with like children's services or the police or something like that. Brittany, how do you anticipate or how have you worked with even those types of clients? So it might not be somebody we're celebrating, might be somebody everybody is angry with for some reason. I can think of two I've worked with where, you know, it would be very hard for me to tell people, oh, I am this person's clinician. Thank goodness I legally cannot because, you know, there's a certain amount of heat that would come with that and a certain amount of heat that person feels. How do you manage that? Um, so I haven't had one on a larger scale as far as like national, but I feel like in the community I have. And mm -hmm. so with those things, I think how you kind of, I guess, help build a rapport the first, the first meetings. And I also think about like just making things overt, like saying, stating what you're here for, letting them know like this is a safe place um, and things of that nature so that they are able to know that you're not judging them from the things that you do know outside or you have seen um, you know, through any type of news or blog or anything of that sort. So I, again, I think the code of ethics is my friend here because I also think about that too. You have to still constantly check yourself and also recognize that the, these people remember they're humans, right? So that little piece of them, or it may seem like a huge piece of them, right? It's still mm -hmm. possibly the, a smaller piece in their world when we think about intersectionalities of a person. So when we think about this famous piece or um, this high profile piece of them, we also still have to think about the other contributing factors related to their mental health and how we're able to help them with that. And still protecting ourselves. And still protecting ourselves, yes. And I think we can protect ourselves through a lot of supervision too, um, especially when we're first like starting out working with high profile clients. When we think about this stuff, we think about all the pressure that they're under, the pressure that we're under, there, there has to be an impact on work and on performance. So what, how do we do supportive things for people who, for instance, an actor who can't remember their lines or somebody who is a vocal artist and they can't sing right now because they've had polyps on their vocal cords or influencers. This is a newer one for me, but somebody who feels like they are no longer successful because they don't have enough likes for whatever that is that they've posted on social media or diminished athletic performance. What, what do we need to be aware of here? Or have I, as I have listed here, Simone Biles as a gymnast with the twisties because she had proprioception issues. If she can't land, she could really be injured. 
this impacts identity. How do we support people here? What is it that mm. folks need to know? Well, I'll, I'll speak to the, um, to the social media influencer thing. I have a nephew who has, you know, over a million um, followers. I'm convinced that 900 and something thousand are there to hate him. But, you know, he's got, you know, 100,000 that you know, apparently love him. Um, he it was taking a ton of heat. And being that he's so young, I, you know, I didn't think he always handled it the right way. He would, you know, uh, um, snap back. And, and what I did is when I saw him, I pulled him to the side and I said, the one of the greatest lessons you'll learn is when to pick and choose your battles. And sometimes just being still and quiet is not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes people need to forget about you a little bit. And I understand that you're an influencer, but there's ways to positively influence. And maybe, you know, that's one thing I would sit down and I would think about. So I generally, when I'm, when I'm dealing with somebody like that, I try to come, I try to approach them with a positive spin on whatever negative situation that they have, but, in, but, but, but also a nice uh, teaspoon of honesty, you know, which is that at times you need to sit down and be still. You're not the first person to have to do that, but you know, people get the wrong impression. They think, you know, they think they know something of you or they think they know what type of person you are. I know you to be a completely different animal. So it's, maybe it's time for you to take a small break. You know, let's, let's, let's step back, observe and evaluate what's going on. And then just, why not try a different approach? If you're getting, you know, like they say, the, the, what, is, what is definition of sanity? Doing the same thing over and expecting a different result. Well, if that is what you're getting, maybe it's time to, to rethink our approach. So I, I mean, I've, I've been trying to help in that, in, into that arena. And I think if you notice, you haven't seen a lot of craziness going on. Hopefully as the age and he becomes more mature, he'll understand likes aren't that important. Decency yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, Doc, I'm gonna send them to you, um, Dr. Tiff. So, you know, <laughs> I probably yeah. probably would throw the question back at you in terms of you know what I mean what 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 ways could we help individuals who are you know kind of dealing with these things? Yeah, well, mm -hmm. I would say largely we have to help them realize that this that identity is not the entirety of who they are. So, for instance, um, Tanisha, you were talking about your other nephew. You have more than one nephew. Your other nephew and that connection to social media and being an influencer and how important that is professionally that is not the entirety of who he is and if mm -hmm. you let that suck you up it can diminish and reduce the way that you identify and define yourself um even with you ron i remember you and i worked with somebody once it was much more you than me but this person could not control their response to social media and got themselves in some pretty significant trouble it is a pretty big deal um Brittany, you talked about um, a professional singer and well, you can, I'll let you explain it yourself. Well, yes, I talked about Adele when we had our conversations in the past, cause I love Adele, Adele's my girl. Um, but also, you know, she went through um, losing her voice or had some type of vocal issue to where she had to stop doing her concerts. And so when we think about how, <clears throat> excuse me, um, this impacts her work and things of this, that nature, then it also impacts the other pieces of her life as well, like how her stability may have changed and how that may feel for her. So I guess to go back to kind of answer your question about what we possibly can do, I like that someone in the chat put um, unconditional positive regard because I definitely think that is needed. Um, but I also would like to add that I think that um, like sometimes even just maintaining silence with them could be useful or having some type of mindfulness things. Just how you, you explain like some of the um, athletes before have gotten themselves into trouble or maybe struggling being able to control, you know, how the media and how millions of people are responding to them. Um, then I was just focused on like mindfulness and the, thing, the interventions and things that we've learned also throughout our schooling as well and how that can be useful. Oh. Yes. And the other thing we focus on sometimes is this person's small world. What was your world before all the fame? Who was there? And how much can those people who were there, those, those actual connected people to you, be supportive of you as you work through whatever it is you're going through at the moment? So knowing what this person's support system is made up of and who 
has been there, what they like, what they enjoy, what could they do if they were by themselves for a week and no one was going to bother them? What types of things might they incorporate? And then helping them understand what depression and anxiety actually are, what they look like, how anxiety is future oriented, and you kind of worry about what will happen or what could happen. And depression is the series of, of kind of tainted versions of the truth that are often lies that make you feel bad about yourself. And having a person ground themselves in the present so that they aren't so consumed with the future and so consumed with the past because you can't change either one of those. You can influence your future, past has happened. So we've kind of talked about a little bit of this, but it's important to also keep in mind why some people might be reluctant, especially high profile people to seek supports from even you know, clinicians, from player engagement, from their agents, from whomever might be a support to them because it might be culturally inconsistent. Some people might believe that in my group, however my group is defined, we don't ask for help like this. I last heard that this Saturday and this person went on to say, if I ask for help, it makes me weak. It does not make you weak. In fact, it might be a weaker thing not to ask for help when you need it. To me, that was the equivalent of saying, I know my foot is broken, but if I put a cast on it and use a crutch, that makes me weak. No, it allows you to heal so that you can become stronger. Some people believe they need to suffer in silence and just suck it up, whatever that actually means. And I think the pandemic in some ways was a blessing and a, well, it was a lot of curse, a lot of bit of a blessing because people were able to reach out a little bit more for support. And I'd like to know what the three of you think of those things. Um, I think I can go first. So as we were talking and I think about support, I also think about how maybe sometimes high profile clients, um, they might not be able to identify who their natural supports are. Yes, they may be able to think about their small world, but I can also think, you know, it might be a lot more people that are surrounding them that may make them feel as though they are or can be a natural support. So I think maybe for rookies or um, people that are coming in, then it might be good to kind of even just break down, like, what does your natural supports look like? And which ways do you feel like your natural supports were helpful to get you from point A to point B? still going back to that human piece and not focusing on that celebrity or the high profile um, piece of them. And I think that will help you be able to like get forward with the client when they're focusing on like maybe anxiety or depression or having a hard time um, staying present in the here and now. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. Go ahead. I, mean, I, was, I was gonna jump in cause I, you know, I, I agree with that uh, pride comment. Um, that there is a lot of pride in the high performance individuals. Um, I also say there's a lot of fear too. Um, just when you think about asking for help, just the fear of losing your edge. Um, there is a certain edge that, you know, being a football player, um, being in this environment, there's a, I, there is right or wrong, there is a certain toughness element. Obviously you're out there hitting people, um, you're pushing your body to the max. Um, so there's also a fear that can sometimes, you, you can sometimes have to work around in order to help guys get support, um, you know, just by, you know, just showing them and giving them, you know, letting them know they're not going to lose their edge uh, by, by getting support and help. They're actually going to gain, um, you know, in terms of, you know, what they need to help support what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so, you know, definitely a lot of pride, but I also say if you, there's also an element of fear um, that you could kind of take a different approach to circumvent the pride aspect that you may be seeing in, in, a, in, a, in a high performing athlete. Ron, actually, you, uh, you took the words right out of my mouth. I mean, I 100% agree with what you just said. The pride element to me is huge. Um, I actually am from a house uh, full of nothing but men. And I mean, I, they are some proudful individuals. And I, I know exactly um, what what um, Tiffany's referring to when she's saying certain cultures and stuff, it's not a part, but I always try to, um, you know, bring in the fact that there, no one is invincible and everyone at some point in time generally needs some sort of help. And it's, it, there is no, no shame in asking for assistance when needed. Um, but, but definitely what you said is pretty much hit the nail on the head for me. I mean, that's what I see um, when, I, when I look around um, with the people that I'm dealing with exactly what you were saying high performance you know whether it's the position whether it's I don't want it I'm, I'm the leader of the team I can't I can't put up a facade that I'm weak and I don't want people to see through that 
I, I, I find that, you know, those are pretty much what you said was just right on point. The two things I want to say as we wrap up this slide and then as we get closer to the end, um, I do think it's really important to note that, that organizations do actually have player engagement directors, people who help this person in this high profile position get the help and support, not just mental health help, but various types of help and support that they need, which was not always there. I've shared with Ron before that growing up, we had one of the Cleveland Browns in our family and the services available to NFL players now are very different than what was available to people then because there's more of a recognition of the human needs this person has off the field and how those two things intersect. And you can also go get training in that. I didn't have the training before um, I started working here, but I've since gone back to school and gotten some a graduate certificate in working with counseling people in these types of positions. That's important for us to have as professionals too, just to know what to expect in working in these types of positions. And then just kind of quickly, it's we've talked about this a little bit too. People have identity issues. What happens if I mess up in my next game or my next performance or my next album flops or whatever? Who will help me manage my social media? What do I do with my life after this is over? Because these high profile jobs are usually relatively short term. So somebody might have the most amazing song in the world. Everybody loves this album. This was the best thing ever. Everybody listened to it all summer and you never hear crickets for that person's career after that. There's an identity piece there where everybody knew who I was. I was everywhere and now nobody cares. What is my value? What is my worth? Um, who can I trust? That does my social media following equal my worth and my value? Do people really like me for me? These are the things we have to be aware of as we're working with people in these positions. You know, when a player leaves the Browns, if they are not picked up by another team, how does that person feel about that? If the record label drops this person and nobody cares anymore about what they're doing, how does that feel when they're at an independent label on their own? I feel like when, when I'm dealing with my clients, I'm trying to find out more than what they're wanting to do at the present then more so what else, what, 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 what do you see your life like after that? So that you can kind of set a path for them. So when that day comes, when they end, you know, that whatever that, you know, that career, that there's something else that they can roll, roll into, because I know personally, I've seen what happens when there is no plan after that. It seems like the, the there's disbelief that I can no longer do what I used to do or I'm no longer good enough to do what I used to do and you see that even with some of the athletes now who haven't been picked up and they're like confused as but 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 why not it, you know it's me or whatever and I think that um, you know working with the person to uh, to, to, to let them know what life looks like after uh, that journey is done, I found like it, it can be extremely helpful. And those are one of the things when I was taking classes on trying to work with clients, that's what they do. They try to prepare them for the future along with why they're, what they're doing in the present to assist with, you know, what happens when, when the lights go out or you're not, you know, you're not the star anymore. Okay. All right. And then this kind of continues that. What do we do with people when they have injuries that are physical injuries, mental health injuries? How does this impact them? And it's kind of the same stuff we were talking about just a slide ago. I do want to ask you specifically, Ron, one question. You also impress me by sharing with the people who are athletes that there is something else they can focus on too, like going back to school or getting their degree or having some plans for the future. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I've always had just kind of a personal belief being a former athlete that, you know, every athlete stops playing the sport at some point. Um, so it, our creator, whoever, like, you know, had, had to have known that there was something else we were capable of doing. Um, and I've always taken that mindset with our athletes, even at this level, um, to where it's, you know, you see, um, how quickly an average person plays in the NFL three and a half years. Um, even the guy who played 10 years, like he's 28, 29, 30, um, and, and just kind of just starting their life, in my opinion. Um, so you got to, one, you got to ignore the, the financial aspect. I think everybody likes to like put so much emphasis where they made millions, they made plenty of money. 
Um, and, and I just tell you, like, that doesn't continue, that doesn't keep life going when you're waking up at 30 and, and you don't have to, you, you know, nobody's calling your name, nobody's screaming your name, no, no coaches, you're not in coaches meetings, you're not doing the sport that you've been doing for the last 25 years. Um, you know, that, those, that money isn't going to continue your life. Um, and so the initially, the initial thing is to throw that financial aspect, like out of your thoughts, if you're helping and engaging with an athlete. And then, like you said, secondly, Doc, like there's some other skill set that they have, uh, whether it's music, uh, whether it's real estate. We'll do a real estate session here on Monday um, just to teach guys who are interested, just kind of maybe how to build um, a real estate portfolio um, is something that they're interested in and how to manage properties. So there are things that we do going back and finishing your degree, as you mentioned, getting an a, a, a advanced degree. Um, it, guy, uh, guys have other interests. Um, and mm -hmm. so I always try to point towards those to pull them out of them uh, to prepare them for life after football. Thank you much. All right. So the last thing that I want to talk about, and then we will, I think we are done after that pretty much. We talked about these other things is the legal and ethical piece and having people who are sick of us around folks, the yes people, the people who just say yes to everything and make this person believe they don't have to work hard for anything outside of their primary um, talent and how dangerous that can be and how we also need to maintain confidentiality around people. We've talked a little bit about that. The one example I do want to share around this is I mentioned going back to school and getting a certificate in um, sports counseling. And the very first assignment that I had was, you know, you are the lead clinician for the Cleveland Browns and this particular person has these particular issues. And it was something that really happened to somebody before I ever worked there. And just how they were willing to exploit this human being's problems as a class assignment and talk about it and pick it back and forth and not really pay attention to how there's a human being there underneath all of this stuff and just to use him without his permission um, for, I guess, educational purposes. It's really important to keep in mind that these people who folks are trying to snuggling up to and trying to associate themselves with for their own benefit and for their own gain are actually human beings. And it can be really yeah. harmful and hurtful to treat people this way. Okay. All right, I do wanna make sure we, were you gonna say something wrong? No, I okay. think you hit it right on. Okay, so talked about that already. Talked about all these already. We wanna make sure we leave some time for your questions. Are there any questions anybody has for us before we wrap up in these last few minutes? I'm applying for my practicum at a movie studio. They have a, I guess, a similar position that Ron has um, to be working with them. Would you say most of these issues are similar to, you know, actors essentially? I would think that yes, high profile people, regardless, actors, singers, athletes, influencers, all even sometimes more infamous people like that person who did this particular crime or whatever, who still needs some kind of mental health support, but they have a high profile. There are lots of issues that follow all of them. One of the things we didn't talk about with all of these different types of people is in many cases, one day this person was a regular person. And then fairly suddenly they go from, you know, being just a regular person to somebody everybody knows. And there are lots of psychological issues that can come along with that all of the things that we were discussing who do i trust what is this like do i have to keep this up can i give myself a break what happens when nobody knows me anymore and the amount of stress and pressure that accompanies that so in a movie studio it's not just the actor it's like that executive or that agent and all of those other people too who also need to keep their jobs who have pretty um, important positions in that studio they also have stressors so that would be a really interesting place i suspect for you to do your field work yeah, I mean, I'm married to an executive of a large company and the stress that he has keeping the company rolling in the right direction, especially through the pandemic. I don't think a lot of people realize they see sort of the fanciness of his job, but not the the why he has the perks, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, no, I think I always tell people like they everybody sees Sunday. Um, I mean, we're here Monday through Saturday too. 
you know, and nobody sees that aspect of it. Um, and then, like you said, just the pressure of just trying to go out there and perform on Sunday um, mm-hmm. and what Mondays look like if you don't perform, you know? And so, you know, I think in the profession that you're potentially going into, I put, if you put it in three buckets and it's, it's, it's money, it's notoriety, and it's the pressure to perform, right? You could really put those three things, whether you're an NFL athlete, where you're a movie star, I think those three things bring a certain level of stress or um, a need to have skills, certain skill sets and areas to overcome the things that come with those three areas. Um, I think, you know, you'll see that um, the skills that you are able to give them and provide them and help them with will help them succeed now that they have the pressures of those three areas, if that makes sense. The uh, fact that I don't um, recognize anyone ever, do you think that will hurt or help me? No, no. You know what? I'm so glad you said that because we talked about this earlier. I I told Doc Tiff, like, I don't hire anybody who comes in here with a bunch of Browns gears on and that can, you know, talk about what we should have done last Sunday in the game or can reel off our whole roster like, I will not hire anybody that comes in. You know, that goes back to what we were talking about, that fanboys. Like, I need you to be a professional to do your job. I need you to understand um, some of the things that they may be dealing with. Um, but if you come in and you can reel off all of this stuff and you try to, you know, show how, you know, good you are and all this knowledge of being a fan, um, the interview will be extremely quick. <laughs> so I think Thank that you. helps. Basically, I think that helps you. Thank you. It allows you to humanize them. You can see the people as people. It does. What other questions do you have? We have maybe time for one more. We have a question in the comments of how did COVID change how you approach your work over those few years? That's from Jordan. All right. Well, and you probably have interesting answers for how COVID impacted yeah, that's a great question. Um, the only reason it was different, I would say it's different for us was because the train didn't really stop. Like it, it, it changed course a little bit, but I mean, we were in here wearing masks and, you know, we were playing and the broadcast that you guys saw on Sunday looked nothing like the stadium was. Like the stadium was dead. There was nobody in there. But you know, if you were to watch the game on Sunday during COVID, you would think it was, a, you know, nothing had changed. Um, and so our, our work didn't really change as much. I think you, you dealt more with, you had to keep guys going during COVID um, because you dealt more with the mental isolation um, and being in the house, which I think a lot of people dealt with. Um, from, from a mental health standpoint, you had to get really creative um, you know, to kind of, again, keep guys going until we could get to practice or until we could get to the next meeting. Um, so I, I'll say we actually had it maybe a little better than other people did, um, fortunately, because we were able to keep the train moving a little bit with meetings and practice, and, and we were able to gather. Um, so, I, you know, we had it a little different to say that it changed as much. Um, you know, because now we're, we're right back in here. We don't do too many Zoom meetings and things like that anymore. We're kind of right back in the fold. Mm-hmm. So with that said, I thank you all for coming to listen to our presentation. I hope you got out of it what you anticipated. And if you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. You can email me if you have questions for the other panelists. I'm more other presenters. I'm more than happy to send those questions forward to them. So yeah, thank, thank you. you all. And if you are here for the CE certificate, I just put the link for the survey in the chat as well. Great. Thank you to the presenters. Thank you to everyone else. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much for having us. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Dr. Malone, oh, I think she already left. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Have a nice day. Yep. Bye-bye. Do we wait? I can't wait with you. Okay. Oh, okay. I'll send you Bye-bye. a message. Bye. <laughs>